very much, Irina. Uh, welcome, everybody. So let's get started. Uh, what is this webinar about? First, I will give you some background on the International Treaty and the Standard Material Transfer Agreement and access to the plant genetic resources as well as to information, which is the core business of all this uh, webinar. I will try to describe the problem that we currently face when uh, trying to access information associated to plant genetic resources. Uh, I will try to explain the solution that we are uh, implementing, trying to address this problem. But, of course, we also have challenges uh, that uh, we will be facing in uh, doing so, so we will look at them. And we will try to see what the future has in uh, hand for us. So, let's start uh, with a short introduction on the treaty, the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. The purpose of the treaty is to promote the conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, but also to make sure that there is a fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the use of such uh, uh, plant genetic resources. So, uh, it's interesting to note that the treaty puts the access to the material as well as the access to the information at the same level. So, it is recognized that uh, getting information on the material is critical to an effective uh, development and conservation of the material itself. The uh, treaty was established in 2004, and we currently have 144 countries that have signed and ratified the contract, uh, the treaty, excuse me. So, Article 17 of the treaty calls, uh, as you can read it here, for this global information system as a way to facilitate access to scientific, technical, and environmental data relating to the plant genetic resources conservation and use. But the important thing is that the global information system should be based on existing systems. So we don't want to replicate and reinvent the wheel. We want to make sure that uh, we facilitate access and integration of the existing systems so that they cooperate in a more effective way. The treaty is implemented through the multilateral system of access and benefit sharing. So basically, this is a system through which access to the plant genetic resources material is facilitated. The benefits arising from the use of this material are equitably shared through the benefit sharing fund and there are monetary and non-monetary benefits. So, in some cases, donors or uh, um, parties that acquire material through the treaty and uh, make a commercial um, exploitation of this material, they contribute part of their income to the multilateral, to the benefit sharing fund. But there are also non-monetary benefits that deal with uh, uh, capacity building, uh, access to technology, access to information, as we will see. The access to the material is regulated to the Standard Material Transfer Agreement, that is a private contract, uh, the same contract for everybody, that's why it's called the standard, and it is between the provider and the recipient, so the two parties that are uh, involved in the exchange of the material. And there is also the third party beneficiary, which is FAO at this time, that will uh, overlook the proper uh, and coordinate the proper working of the treaty and the standard material transfer agreement. The standard material transfer agreement itself regulates the exchange of the material and also of the information, as we will see. This is the obligation for the provider. So, together with the material, the provider has to make available all the non-confidential descriptive information, including all available passport data, related to the material. On the other hand, the recipient has its own obligation, which is to contribute all the non-confidential information obtained through research made on the material received from the multilateral system. So, both parties the provider and the recipient, agree to contribute information on the material and increase this wealth of information and make it available for, to everybody. 
So in reality, this is a way of uh, uh, the information associated to material is a non-modernary benefit that is made available through the treaty and through the SMTA mechanisms to everybody. Unfortunately, what we have now is this uh, situation here. We have the provider that has got some material A and uh, some uh, research on this material results in a publication on a scientific journal of the results. The uh, citation of the material refers to A, which is the internal identifier that the provider has assigned to this material. And on the other hand, the recipient receives the material A from the provider, and the first thing he does is assign his own local identifier. So, in the recipient's collection, material A coming from the provider is identified by a different identifier called B, in our case. Let's assume that the recipient also does some uh, scientific research on this material and publishes the result. What the recipient does, of course, is cite mention in the publication his own identifier B. The problem is that the relation between A and B is known to nobody, at most is available to the recipient. Somewhere in his system it's written that may be written that B is actually coming from A. So the issue is that somebody from outside has no way of uh, understanding that the results published under B can also be applied at some extent to the results published for A. This is exactly the kind of problem that we have. So we have a proliferation of results, but their effective use is diminished by the fact that we don't have a proper understanding of the relationships among the materials that are mentioned in these publications. So, how we hope to address this problem? We start with the provider that registers material A in GLIS in the Global Information System that returns a DOI. This DOI is a digital object identifier and is assigned to material A. When the provider publishes the results, he should mention in the publication the DOI that is assigned to the material. And also, if he likes, he can also assign um, uh, site his own identifier. But the critical point is that the DOI is mentioned in the publication. Let's see now what happens with the recipient. The recipient receives the material A along with the DOI it is associated to. The recipient assigns the new local identifier B and registers it to GLIS, providing the DOI of the original material. GLIS returns a new DOI, DOI2. Now the recipient publishes the results, again mentioning his own DOI, DOI2, and his own local identifier, B. The important thing is that the relationship between DOI1 and DOI2 is now maintained both in GLIS and in the DOI system, which means that a third party coming from outside can now see that the results published on DOI1 are also applicable to the material B, because there is this relation between DOI1 and DOI2 that lets him go through the uh, an evolution of the material and uh, so that he can find the related publications. Let's have a look uh, at a typical example. We have a provider one that has a material A, in this case I call material A, but we can think about uh, DOI A, that is transferred to another recipient, recipient one. So there is a transfer relationship between material B and material A. Through the mechanism that we have described in the previous slide, this relationship between B and A is recorded and maintained. Let's assume that now provider A also, provider 1, sorry, also transfers material A to another recipient, but in this case, as you can see, the same DOI is used because this recipient is not maintaining the 
material for further distribution and conservation. It's just doing some DNA sequencing. So, in fact, Recipient 2 can be seen as a service provider to provider 1. And after the DNA sequencing is done, the material is destroyed. This is what happens normally when you send material out for this kind of uh, analysis. Let's now think about uh, recipient 1 transferring material B to another recipient, called in this case recipient 3 to a transfer. A new DOI, C, is assigned. Somewhere else, a new provider has material D, this is transferred to recipient 4, and it gets a new DOI called E. Recipient 4 performs a process of selection, obtaining a new material to which a new DOI is assigned, F. On this material, the recipient publishes a data set. Then, this new material, F, is transferred back to recipient 3, that gets a new DOI to it, uh, is called G. Then this recipient performs a cross between these two materials, obtaining a new one that is called H. It's got a new DOI called H. And on this one, there is a publication of uh, research results. Then recipient 3 also transfers this new material to recipient 5 that also publishes some results. So, as you can see, there is a quite a complicated uh, life and uh, evolution of these materials that are transferred, that are crossed, that are selected, data are published about them at different stages of their life. So the problem is how do you actually access all this information? Currently, you cannot, because for the problem that we have seen before, there is no tracking of the relationship of the materials as they evolve through their life. So, for instance, uh, what we can do here instead is now we can access any one of these materials through their DOIs, and through this relationship being recorded, we can navigate and find out, ah, this, there is a data set published. It is up to our professional judgment to decide how much the information that we find at each node is actually applicable to the material that we started from. So we have what we call neighbors, neighborhoods, sorry. This is one that involves uh, two publications and a data set. So you can get through the chain of uh, DOIs anywhere in this uh, subset and identify the resources available and establish uh, their usefulness for your specific requests. This is another one. In this case, as the, you see, the material has been just transferred across, it is likely that the publication, the data published in this journal are applicable to some extent also to the information associated to the material I. This is because just the transfer occur between the two. In this other case, instead, you can say that there has been a selection here or there has been a cross. So the applicability of these results to this material may be uh, not so high. But this is something that you decide and you are able to decide because you will be able to find this information, something that you cannot do now. So we have seen how DOIs will help us in maintaining this important uh, set of relationship across materials. Now the issue is how do we assign the OIs to PGRFAs? Well, the first thing to do is to understand and decide what we assign the DOI to. What does the DOI correspond to? The first thing that we have decided is that the DOI is associated not to the description of the material, but to the actual material. This means that, uh, as in the description of the material, as we will see later on, there are things such as the taxonomy, genus, species, uh, subtaxa, and so on. There are information about uh, countries of provenance, there are dates, and there are names of institutions and other things that may change over time. This, as we have seen in a previous webinar with DOIs, will cause 
the uh, pressure to uh, assign a new DOI to the material. While, of course, the seed is exactly the same regardless of how we describe it. So the first thing is to say, okay, we assign DOIs to the physical material. So if there is a change to the taxonomy, which is something that occurs because the taxonomy is subject to periodic revisions, we don't need to issue a new DOI. We just go there and update the description of the material, maintaining the same DOI. There is another aspect. The DOI is also assigned, associated to the holder of the material. The holder of the material has a special role because the material is maintained in the collection of the holder and therefore is subject to the holder's quality control standards, the holder propagation and regeneration procedures, so, and, and the holder's access uh, regulations and so on. So we felt that it was critical for us to keep, in, uh, keep into account also the holder of the material because when the material is transferred, as we have seen in the previous uh, uh, slide, we need to assign a new DOI because even assuming that the destination material is exactly the same as the original material in genetic terms, it is actually put under a different context. And therefore, in this case, a DOI should be assigned, a new DOI should be assigned to the uh, material when it is incorporated in the recipient's collection. Then we have to define, we have defined the descriptors that are associated to the DOI to, as you, for those of you who have participated to the previous, uh, uh, attended the previous uh, webinar on DOIs, because we need to support the functions of discovery and resolutions that we will discuss briefly now. So the descriptors we have adopted are based on the multi-crop passport descriptors, that is a, a widely adopted standard created by FAO and uh, uh, Bioercid International that describe uh, uh, several attributes of the plant genetic resources material. We have divided the descriptors into three classes. We have mandatory descriptors, those that you have to provide in order to get the DOI. So we need to know who is holding the material, what is the species, how this material was obtained, which is what we call method, when this happened, the date, and the local identifier that is uh, uh, you know, assigned to the material in the collection of the holder. Then we have recommended the descriptors that are not strictly required to obtain but that we would like to have in order to provide more sophisticated services to the users. Uh, examples of this kind of descriptors are the biological status, links to web resources where more information about the material can be found, also the, if the material is available under the multilateral system, and so on and so forth. We also have other uh, descriptors that we call additional that are used to enrich the description of the uh, material so that we better support resolution and discovery. Let's quickly recap. Resolution is when you have a DOI and you want to see what this DOI is associated to. So you enter the DOI into the global information system or into any other DOI resolving service and you are led to a page where you have the list of descriptors. So you see that this, this is a plant genetic resources material that is maintained by this holder, they obtain it this way, and so on and so forth. This is resolution. Discovery is the other way around. You have some information about this material, but you don't know it's DOI. So what you do, you enter the information you have, this attribute, this descriptor that you know in the uh, discovery page, and you find out the list of applicable DOIs. An example, give me the list of all the material that is maintained in uh, this institute, uh, and it is of genus uh, Trivium. Okay? So this is, the this is the discovery, the contrary, the inverse of the resolution. 
So once we have defined the set of descriptors, the next step was to uh, map our descriptors that are specific to the field of plant genetic resources to the metadata structure offered by DataSite. DataSite is the DOI registration agency, the DOI provider that the global information system uses to get DOIs. Now, as the DOI system deals with all kinds of resources, it deals with uh, publications, it deals with data sets, it deals with uh, you know, uh, thesauri, it deals with plant genetic resources in our case, it deals with all sorts of things. Um, forcibly, the data site metadata description is quite general. So what we have to do is to map our descriptors to the data site ones. So some of our descriptors went into the title metadata field of data site. From on the left you see our descriptors, on the right you see the data site field in which we put our stuff. The holder of the material went into the contributor. The acquisition or the collection date went into the date and date type and so on and so forth. So we had to do this quite complicated mapping to put our information into the global into the data site metadata. So the Global Information System, which is the software application that does all these uh, uh, functions, has the purpose of facilitating access to the information as it is. We don't want to copy the information into GLIS because, as you may remember from Article 17, we want GLIS to be based on existing systems. So existing systems stay as they are, GLIS is a way of facilitating access to the systems and facilitating their interoperability. This is obtained through identification of PGRFAs via the digital object identifiers. And what we store in GLIS is just those descriptors that we have seen before, which is some basic information about the material to support the discovery and resolution functions, as explained before. Also, an important aspect is the collection into GLIS of the links to web pages or websites where users will be able to find more detailed information so that the non-confidential information that the provider and the recipient are called to contribute according to the SMPA can be made available through GLIS. We also want to build on this foundation and provide more advanced services. So what we do is we promote standards and formats that will facilitate the integration among different systems and access to the information stored in these systems. We also have identified few systems, one for gene banks and one for breeding activities that we call BLESSED because we are working with the developers of these systems to integrate them with GLIS. So for those institutions that are looking for a replacement of their system or they don't have any system at all, we tell them, please have a look at these ones because they will not only solve your documentation problem, but they will also allow you to integrate with GLIS and therefore access the benefits that GLIS will offer to the community. We also participate in capacity building and data quality improvement activities, so we provide support and we help training people. We do train people with the contribution of sponsors and uh, uh, donors to facilitate and improve the quality of the information that we receive. Finally, but uh, last but not least, I would say, we try to strengthen the ties among communities. For historical reasons, gene banks, breeders, farmers, and so on, each one of these communities has been somewhat isolated by others. Instead, we need to have these communities and others, national inventories, research institutions, universities, and so on, collaborate together and exchange information in a more effective way. So what are the advanced services that GLIS will offer besides registering material and getting the OIs? Well, the first thing is what we said before. We will provide this uh, 
tracking of the relationship among the different material so that you will be able to have this kind of visualization of the relationship among different genetic resources, different colors, different lines, and you will be able to navigate through this representation to find additional information that are available at each node. We also have some uh, functions that uh, one is this has metadata expansion because as we said we had to map our descriptors into the data site metadata structure. So this in a way made it um, less easily accessible by systems and through this has metadata function of data site we are able to provide a full XML representation of our own descriptors available through the DOI system. We also offer what is called the content negotiation so that the results from GLIS can be obtained by an application using a variety of formats so that uh, we can offer the results in XML, JSON, JSON linked data, Darwin Archive or uh, BRAPI which is the uh, breeding API that is getting a lot of uh, uh, support from uh, the breeding community. Event Data is another service that's based on a collaboration between a data site and Crossref. Crossref is another registration agency that focuses more on publications. So that what happens is that you get a DOI for your material, you publish the results on a publication, and this publication gets its own DOI by Crossref, most likely. So data site that issued the original uh, DOI associated to material and the Crossref that issued the DOI associated to the publication on the material join together their services so that GLIS will be able to automatically find all the publications that cite the DOI associated to your material. This would be alone, this would be an extremely, extremely important and useful service so that you know you will be able to access all the publications that are associated to your material and through the tracking of the relationships you will be able to access to all the publications associated to materials related to the one you started from. This is incredibly powerful and is something that has not been possible so far. So what does GLIS for the user community? The first thing is we cover the cost. There are still some costs although they are now very very much lower than in the past there is still some cost associated in getting the OIs. So for the user of GLIS we provide access to the OI minting uh, creation of the OIs free of charge. That is covered by the treaty secretariat. The treaty is a member of data site. I also have the privilege of being a member of the board. So the idea is that through this membership affiliation with data site, the needs of the plant genetic resources community will be heard in the data site uh, organization and we will make sure that the data site evolves in a way that it is useful to us as other communities that are also represented in data site. We provide the support for GLIS users through a variety of activities. Uh, we advise the users on adopting the DOIs through the documentation, through training courses, through webinars such as this, and to other ways of interacting with potential users to show them what needs to be done and what are the advantages of doing so. We also provide uh, what is called an integration toolkit, which is a software application that uh, facilitates the um, integration between your database and the GLIS so that you can have a registration of material to get the OIs, so you can have update of information on the OIs and you can also notify GLIS of the transfers that we have seen before so that this set of relationships is maintained. We also publish 
formats and protocols to interoperate with GLIS so that if your institutions has the capacities and the capabilities to implement your own solution, you are very welcome to do so and we will be happy to provide the support and advice in that. So, now let's go down to more practical issues. How do you actually register your material and get to the OIs? Well, the easiest is to access a web form. GLIS will provide a web form where you can just provide the necessary information and obtain a DOI in return. Of course, this being fully manual uh, can be, you know, recommended for small collections or can be used in case you just need to go there and fix a typo or uh, update some information about the DOI. But it's something that is used for a, a small number of transactions. We also provide an uh, we also provide a registration function through Excel spreadsheets or text-based, uh, text-limited uh, files. That is what we recommend for small size collections, say thousands of materials, of accessions. And also we use this as a stopgap solution. While you uh, go for the next option, which is more complicated but more powerful, you can use this one in the meantime to get started. The recommended solution is this XML-based integration protocol that is implemented by the integration toolkit that I mentioned before and allows you to uh, work with very large collections, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of materials and also provides a real-time uh, integration between your system and GLIS. So what is the future of this? The future of this is to become the Google of PGRFA. The parallel with Google, which is a very widely known system, is important in two ways. Google is the place where everybody goes to find information about everything. We are trying to make uh, this become the same thing for plant genetic resources. When you need to find information on plant genetic resources, you go to GLIS. That is our aim. There is the other aspect also, is that Google does not copy information from existing systems. As you know, Google just gets information about the pages and then routes you to the destination. And that's exactly what GLIS uh, wants to do. We don't want to copy information from your system. We want to make your system more visible and more easily accessible through GLIS as you normally do through Google. There are also links that uh, we will do in GLIS to make a, a existing systems available that are already here in FAO and in other partners available through GLIS. For instance, for technology transfer, traditional knowledge, which is uh, increasingly becoming important, for early warning and threat advisory, we have excellent systems here in FAO, which is called VIEWS, that does exactly this. We have links to system on regulations for quarantine, uh, for trade regulations, uh, you know, these kind of things. And also, we provide the connections to other initiatives, such as the um, CBD, the Commission on Biodiversity, that has its own set of you know, services and the regulations that have to be adhered to. We also participate in the standard setting initiatives to promote interoperability and data exchange across systems and also promote access to distributed systems so that agents or software applications that are uh, becoming more and more important because the wealth of information out there is increasing so quickly people are finding that they cannot do the selection of information manually. They need an agent or they need an application that does the harvesting of the information for themselves. So access to this kind of applications to your systems in the, uh, in the web is becoming more and more important to make your system useful. We also collaborate with existing initiatives that are developing systems. These are the ones that we call the, the blessed systems. 
In FAO, we have uh, views, as we already mentioned. We also have uh, genesis in, uh, uh, maintained by the Global Crop Diversity Trust that, and also in a collaboration with FAO and other uh, entities. Genesis is a global repository of gene bank information, uh, gene bank accession information, excuse me. So Genesis is a place where users through this will go to find information, more detailed information about uh, gene banks. But they are not only gene banks. We need to have a Genesis-like initiatives for breeding or for other uh, sectors. So we also promote the adoption of selected systems. One is Green Global, which is a gene bank management system, and the other one is for results, which is a new system that the International Rice Research Institute has developed and is now making available to third parties that deals specifically with breeding applications. So how do you find out more about GLIS and DOIs? By going to this uh, URL, which is the 3D URL in the FAO website, where there you will find the details on the treaty, you will find the details on the global information system, on DOIs, the descriptors that we have published, the guidelines, which are use cases in which, through which you can understand in what cases you need, or better, you should, because nothing here is uh, compulsory, it's all voluntary, and we need to make sure that GLIS attracts people because of its advantages. So the guidelines help you identify the cases in which a new DOI should be assigned, or, or those in which a new uh, DOI does not need to be assi uh, assigned. You also have uh, frequently, frequently asked questions and uh, links to selected documents and websites. And this also yes, thank you very will much. come short.